That works. Okay, so I'll, I'll go ahead and introduce the panel. Uh, to my immediate right, I have uh, Roma Thurin. She's the founder and managing partner of Thurin Law Group uh, and uh, founder of Third Coast Cannabis Consulting. Um, next, to, next to her is uh, Rick Pruce. He's the business representative for the IBEW Local uh, 58 in Detroit. Uh, that's the uh, Electrical Workers Union. Uh, and then next to him is Eric Mahler, the assistant general counsel at Meritor, um, a mostly heavy truck uh, manufacturer. Um, so yeah, so we're going to focus a little bit, let me get this out, <laughs> on kind of the hiring practices and how a business handles marijuana um, now that it's legal and, and uh, it's being used a little more broadly, maybe, we don't know. Um, but I want to start with Eric because <clears throat> as a multinational employer, um, you've got a lot of different rules to follow here. Uh, you have a zero tolerance drug policy, correct? How has that changed? Has it changed? Yeah, I think that's the key question. So we, you know, our global headquarters is here in Michigan where we've passed laws that uh, legalize cannabis, uh, but most of our manufacturing facilities in the U.S. anyway are in the South and Southeast, very different politically, a very different culture, a uh, very different outlook. You have uh, some very, uh, conservative uh, views down there about just politics in general and on this in issue in particular, then you have another uh, section of the population who sees cannabis as, you know, the new moonshine, right? There's just something that you can, you know, hey, we'll just do it and not talk about it. Uh, but, you know, if you follow the manufacturing industry, which a lot of people in Michigan do, you know that over the last several years, we've had you know record volumes, we've had you know record level orders in the truck industry. Uh, Meritor is a global company. We manufacture uh, uh, axles and brakes and drivetrains for large commercial vehicles. So if you see an 18 wheeler going down the freeway, most of what's underneath is is what we do. Uh, we've seen record level volumes, which means record level workers in our plants, uh, and. There is a struggle, I'll be frank about it, within our company about, hey, do we still need a zero tolerance policy when we really need workers? And there's kind of a mentality of, if we don't do it, the guys down the street will do it, and all the workers that we need will go down the street and they'll get hired there. They're not gonna pre-screen people for cannabis, and they're not gonna randomly test people for cannabis unless there's an accident or something like that and some liability questions come up. So. Are we gonna sacrifice these workers that we really need to meet our production levels and meet our customer demands? Uh, I will tell you that there are some high level executives, in, including people who are directly responsible for those output numbers in my company who lean on me quite heavily. Um, then there are some more people who are, you know, maybe of the bean counter liability type who say, uh, I don't know, should we do that? I'm not sure. Uh, so. To your question, Dustin, are we looking at relaxing that? Yeah, that's been an internal struggle for us for uh, a while now, ever since uh, medical marijuana was passed in 2009. Uh, should we allow that? Uh, I think that's starting to swing, and there's a lot of various ways you can go with that. Is it driven by business needs? Is it driven by what society thinks? Um, you know, we haven't relaxed it yet uh, for a lot of different reasons, but uh, that's not to say that the that the conversation and the struggle isn't taking place right now. Uh, in fact, I'm gonna go back and have a meeting later this week with some of those people just about this very topic. Good, uh, Rick, I'm gonna, I'm gonna come to you next because you don't get a choice. Uh, you don't get to set the rules. Uh, the employers that hire your union members set the rules. So explain how that, how that impacts your ability to, to influence what happens with, to, to your union members. Thank you. Uh, and in balance, it's collectively bargained, so we both agree. So uh, sure, both okay, yeah, so sorry, sorry. These are collective bargaining agreements that we have, so we both, both employer sure. and, and labor, agree on, on what those standards are. And I think we need to put in context why those standards are in place. Uh, we're a 128-year-old uh, local union. We've been here for 128 years in Detroit. And uh, just, just to make sure that people understand, that we, we fought very hard for all the safety standards, before which there was none. And so we, we fought, uh, as you guys probably know, the history here in Detroit that, you know, this is a very heavily unionized town because of all the industry that we have here. And just think about this. Half of our industry 
would die within the first two years of uh, joining. So it was, it was just um, a matter of being able to, to, to survive. That's why we, we built a safety industry around us to try to keep our people safe. And with all that money that we spent, time, energy, all these rules that we have in place were written in blood. I mean, we had a lot of people uh, that uh, risked their lives and died for, for the safety that we have uh, right now. And, and I don't see that changing. Uh, now that we've built this, I mean, 100 years later, they say, well, well good job, we don't, we don't need you anymore. Well, the, there's still th those uh, industries that we have still here historically that uh, require a certain level of, of um, uh, professionalism that we have, uh, that we spend, you know, we spend here in, in Michigan over $50 million a year just on training to provide, to make sure that our employers, and we're multi-employer, by the way, so one day we might be working at uh, the new uh, Chrysler, uh, the Mack engine plant, and, uh, and hopefully we have uh, with uh, GM, excuse me, uh, with uh, the new, uh, now that they're over with the strike, now that we'll have uh, more, more uh, work over at GM that we'll be working over there uh, and building hopefully some uh, electro uh, electric vehicles, uh, so green technology. But yeah, the, the impact uh, for us, uh, as you'd mentioned first, was that the employers uh, are going to be, un the, the, I'll say like uh, going over to Chrysler right now, I should say FCA, excuse me for all those, I'm, I'm old school, so That's Chrysler, okay. uh, Everyone you mean. yeah, uh, that we'll have standards that are already in place that is zero, zero, zero tolerance. You can't, you can't have anybody that is high or drunk or any, on any drugs. So that's not going to change. It's not going to change in the near future. But I would say to Eric, you know, if you need help, we would love to help you with uh, getting more people on the job. Uh, if you need some assistance, if you're having a hard time, we'd love to help with that. Sure. Okay, Roma, I want to come to you. This is this is obviously complicated, right? It's not it's not an easy thing. So so when when a business is designing a drug policy or reviewing their drug policy, what are sort of some of the legal aspects they need to consider? I mean, I, I know this is can be this is sort of the basic part that people need to get right. I, I kind of want that to be out there. Yes. <clears throat> Excuse me. Good morning. I would like to just start off by making it very clear that even when there is a drug test, our, our uh, individual employee is tested for cannabis or THC. Um, there's no correlation specifically that it means that that particular employee is impaired and they do not have the ability to perform that particular job duty. As was mentioned, um, th they may have used um, cannabis off-site, off the employer's workplace, in an off-duty time when they were, um, on the weekend, when they were just um, doing their regular daily activities. Um, it's important for the employer to get it right because there may be, um, their rules and regulations or their workplace policy may contradict. Um, some protections that the employee may have, depending on the particular state. There may be some requirements in place that provides the employee protection, which an employer needs to make sure that whatever workplace policy they have in place, that they clearly understand the medical marijuana use regulations within their particular state. Um, there's the requirement that the employers shouldn't just have a blanket policy, I would suggest. They should make sure that their staff is able to detect um, that the employee is actually impaired. How do they do that? There are some um, tests out there that are available. Um, I have not personally had the opportunity to use them, but I did hear a presentation this last weekend at the Bar Association Medical Marijuana Council meeting where Druid, um, they have a, a test that's available and also alert um, meter. I am not, sh I cannot speak to the accuracy of those, but from what I was able to observe from that presentation, it was excellent. Um, because there are other factors beside, beyond THC that may cause impairment, such as fatigue, such as opioids, such as other alcohol. And how do you make that distinguished, that distinguishing analysis from a your analysis or something like that? So I think um, employers need to be cautious when they create these policies and make sure that they contact their counsel and work with them when they're implementing a workplace policy. Sure, and, and Eric, I wanna go back to you. 
you discuss this internal debate between the people, you know, the executives of C-suite. Um, who wins? I mean, it's a very complicated subject. So is it just uh, the loudest voice in the room wins? Or, or, or I mean, because you've been sitting on the fence for quite a while, right? Because it's, it's, it, the Medical Marijuana Act was 2008. So um, it's, it's been 11 years. And now recreation, on November 1st, applications start. Uh, the availability will grow soon. Um, a decision needs to be made soon, right? No, it's a good point. The, you know, my advice to um, people who have asked me this within my own company and others is let's follow the law, first of all. Sure. And, um, you, know, our, our, you know, I think what you're going to find is probably a more refined, nuanced policy, not that we're going to let it all in and we're going to keep it all out, but you'll probably find some middle ground as lawyers are, uh, we're, we're going to parse it and go through and then find some kind of middle ground. Uh, I think, you know, probably the debate now is, you know, we have a lot of people, we're heavy manufacturer, we're not financial services, we're not a PR firm, we have a lot of people who operate dangerous equipment and machinery, lathes, uh, heat treat, if you've ever been in a factory or a plant, um, you know, I think Rick can probably t uh, speak to this as well. Um, do you want to be next to somebody on an assembly line or operating a lathe that may or may not be under the influence of something? And then something happens, a near miss, an accident, um, and you know, we say, hey, well, you know, this person may or may not have THC in their system, whether or not they're impaired or not. Uh, do you want to be the one who's next to that person on the assembly line who may or may not be just a little bit slow uh, putting something down where they should have been or not? So I don't think, to Rick's point or, or Roma's point, that the relaxation about the tolerance is going to change all that much. But I think what you will see is probably a parsing out of pre-employment screening, uh, the robustness, let's say, of random testing, uh, and whether or not we are going to relax any policies about uh, background, criminal background uh, policy searches. I do think that will change as the law changes. Um, and I think we have a panel coming up later that's going to talk about expungement and, and cleaning up people's records, et cetera. Uh, so I do think the pre-employment process will probably change. The uh, on-the-job uh, testing and robustness of that policy may not change so much. That's my guess at the end of the day. Right, and I've heard from, from various lawyers that the way they see it is, is pre-screen, and then the employers test positive. Uh, and they go, we're going to hire you because we need the employee and we, we think you're a good employee. But one screw up, we use this against you. Um, yeah. And, and that, that seems to be kind of a prevailing uh, method to do this. And, and I want to ask Roma if that's what she's also hearing uh, with employers or not. Um, not necessarily. Okay. Um, it, it really depends. No one in, who works in this industry or who represents um, companies in this industry would want any employee to be hired if it was safety sensitive job position. I think we all are in agreement that there has to be rules and regulations around that. Um, I do agree that um, what I'm hearing is that employees, especially in the service industry or hospitality industry, are not um, doing any pre-testing um, prior to hire uh, to a conditional offer. The testing is done after an offer is made. Um, and then there are, um, as I mentioned, if it's safety sensitive, then of course. Um, a lot of employers are making rules also around whether or not they are required, they have a federal contract under the Federal Workplace Drug-Free Environment Act. Um, if they have $100,000 or more in contracts, um, then they're required to have that. But what employers don't necessarily understand, the act does not require that you test pre-employment. It does not require that you um, not hire someone who does have a medical marijuana use card. Um, it just requires that you have a policy in place and that you implement that policy accordingly. So I think it requires us as attorneys and individuals in this industry to go forth with educational sessions like we have in today so that we all are clearly in position to make good choices. Sure. And uh, Rick, I want to go to you now. You, you in our, in our call before, before we, we came and did this, um, you had mentioned a fear of sort of a growing population of drug user. Um, as, as you know, you, you're constantly, you have pre-apprentice programs, you're constantly training, you're trying to get people in the door um, uh, to take these kind of jobs. You know, elaborate a little bit on that fear uh, to me as, as we kind of enter this legalization era. 
there's going to be a vast majority of people that are not going to be eligible for this industry in the construction industry that uh, they will not be able to um, they will not be able to uh, be employed. I mean, you're going to have a large population that doesn't even understand uh, that they will be excluded uh, from this industry. We see it. Uh, we we see some of the evidence of it right now when when we're talking to uh, high school and grade school age kids that uh, not even understanding that marijuana is a drug. You know, and that, you know, when I was a kid, when I was growing up, it was only a very small few people that, but now it's almost a rite of passage now that, you know, everybody's, you know, in these schools, uh, uh, smoking weed is a lot more prevalent, especially in the areas that I'm at, and I'm talking, uh, it's a lot more, more, a lot more predominant mm -hmm. that we see, and, and that's, that makes it difficult for recruitment. Do you see uh, some sort of internal, working internally to, better educate or to change the mindset of the employees or uh, where you're working on your next, your next collective bargaining agreement, coming up with some creative way to allow these people to work while controlling the safety of the environment? That is a very good question. As of right now, no. Uh, there is no uh, zero tolerance. It's not going to change. Uh, we want to make sure that we set that standard right at the beginning. The industry is not going to change on it. Let's not even play around with it. You're not going to be available for this job. Uh, you're not even going to be available for pre-apprenticeship un unless you're clean. You got to make that decision ahead of time before you even decide to start. Sure. Uh, can I make one more point on, yeah, on this, Jesse? Uh, I think a key player in this whole discussion, um, and I don't know if there's anybody from the industry here today that's going to speak or anything, but another key player in this whole discussion will be the insurance industry. We have, we have work comp insurance. We have general liability insurance. We have cybersecurity insurance. Uh, if we decide to not test mm -hmm. and run the risk, uh, I can promise you, you know, any multinational, any company if we're of any size is going to look at an insurance policy for this. Uh, and a lot of what we do and a lot of the policy, the way this shakes out is going to be driven by what is our insurance cover, sure. right? And so are we putting major assets at risk? Is that going to be covered? Uh, whatever, however that shakes out, and I don't know the answer to that yet, but that's going to be a major player in, in the way a lot of multinational companies or companies of any size uh, land on this issue. And I want, I want to uh, st stick with you, Eric, because uh, you're a multinational uh, company. Uh, you also operate in places where it's not legal. You operate in many different states. So is there, uh, how do you draw that distinction? Is it, uh, obviously it's illegal in, uh, for, forgive me, do you have a plant in South Carolina or Georgia? Both, yeah, okay. lot, several plants in the Carolinas. Okay, yeah. um, you know, it's, it's not legal there. So how do you, how do you, operate between that? Do you have to create separate uh, rules for, for where your people operate? Particularly since they travel in many cases, um, it makes it a little more complicated, does it not? Well, yeah, I mean, that's, that's a big part of the debate. I mean, should we have separate rules for uh, a salaried workforce who sit behind a desk all day and an hourly workforce who are on the plant floor? Uh, we are largely non-union. We have a couple of union plants, uh, but I've told people internally you know, the fastest way to unionize is to have one set of rules for the salaries, and then, you know, we're having a tougher set of rules for you hourly people over here. Uh, that will get unions in the plant very quickly. So uh, if you want to reverse that trend and you don't mind unions coming into all our plants, then let's have two sets of rules, right? Mm -hmm. uh, love unions, by the way. But the, the, uh, the I think the, the conversation that we're having internally is, hey, we should have one set of rules for everybody. Uh, we have kind of a random drug testing policy uh, where we test everybody, but uh, to be honest, it's more forcefully applied to the, the hourly workforce who are involved in, in operating heavy equipment and heavy machinery uh, every day. I mean, it's, it's just the reality of it. Do we test the salaried people as much? Eh, probably not. I mean, that's, that's just the reality of it. Uh, so having different policies for different sites because of the law runs its own special set of liability risks, number one. Two, it sends a bad message to the population to say, hey, these people are going to be treated differently than these people, which has its own unforeseen consequences, uh, number two. And again, to the insurance point, I don't know an insurance carrier of any size who would cover a company like Meritor or other tier one suppliers or a GM or a Ford for that matter who would say, yeah, we're going to allow different things in different states uh, just because the laws are different. So uh, those are all things that we've got to think about in the, in the future. Um, and then who knows what's going to happen with these laws. I mean, if the law changes in the next two to three years in some of these states, 
uh, where it might. We have operations in California. Um, that's one set of laws out there. Michigan is coming on board with cannabis. Uh, I don't know where the South is going to land, um, to be frank about it. But I mean, they have a hard time passing transgender, you know, bathroom stuff, let alone cannabis stuff. So I, sure. I don't know where it's going to shake out. Sure. Rama, you, you see me here. Yes, I, I did want to briefly speak to it. And I, I, I apologize up front in that I cannot cite the exact court cases. But I know that there was a case in um, Arizona, I believe, against um, Walmart. And which that particular case, the um, employee was able to go forward because Arizona had protections in place through their medical marijuana law to protect employees against being discriminated against. So it, and then there was a Heinz case too, which also the employee won that case when was allowed to, um, because they said it was discriminatory um, practice for their employee to, um, the employer to terminate the employee because of their use of medical marijuana. I would also, um, Michigan has had a court appeals case in which the employee was terminated and um, they said that they could not collect unemployment benefits, workman's comp unemployment. And um, that also was um, reversed in that the Court of Appeals said that if there was a law in place that protected the medical marijuana user, then in, there could not be um, imposed upon the particular employee just any discriminatory practice that allowed them to continue forward. So that particular employee was allowed to receive their unemployment benefits, although they use um, medical marijuana. So it may be a situation, it doesn't seem um, ideal, but it may be a situation where employers may have to look at case by case, uh, case by cases and state by states be until we are able to do something that's unilateral for everyone. Yeah, that's my follow-up is, does this conversation change when the, I mean, I assume it's inevitable that it becomes legal federally? It does. <laughs> well, and I'll, I think, it, I certainly think it will. Um, I'll give you one example of a situation we went through, which is, uh, you know, you have marijuana still, or cannabis still illegal on a federal level, alcohol is not. Um, you know, we ran up in a situation in one of our Carolina plants where we had a random alcohol testing policy and a random cannabis testing policy, um, one of which is legal on a federal level, one of which is not, of course. Uh, we got a, we terminated an employee through a random alcohol screening who tested above the legal limit, uh, terminated that employee, got hit with an EEOC charge, uh, and the EEOC wanted to, and they've been kind of making test cases where they think they can win against various companies on these random alcohol testing programs. Um, so saying like, hey, a, a random alcohol test under the Americans with Disabilities Act is equivalent of a medical exam. And to have a medical exam under the ADA, you need to have a business necessity to do that. And a business necessity, in our minds, the, this is the Department of Labor talking, uh, a business necessity does not mean we want everybody to be as safe as possible in your plant. That's not good enough. Uh, so just having a random alcohol testing policy can't do that. Uh, and I said, well, you know, they wanted to hit us with a very large fine for this because we had had this random alcohol testing policy for years. And I argued to them, hey, you know, we, number one, want to make our plant as safe as possible. I think that's a business necessity. They didn't buy that. Uh, I said, two, um, you know, even if it's a, you know, not a business necessity, I'm going to go in front of a rural North Carolina jury and I'm going to say, hey, uh, the Department of Labor wants to take away our right to be as safe as possible. Do you agree with that? Um, do you agree that they know what a business necessity is better than we do? So they kind of backed off at that point and, and we made it mostly go away. But once it becomes, if it becomes legal on the federal level, do they now become, cannabis does now become a medical exam under the Americans with Disabilities Act so that the random testing part is now illegal, is now, do they start, in other words, treating it the equivalent of alcohol? Uh, I don't know the answer to that, uh, but it certainly would impact probably our decision making about whether or not we relax our policy or anything like that. So 
Uh, if we don't have a, if, if it becomes legal on the federal level and now we're not allowed to test on a random basis, how does that impact employers? How does that impact our insurance? How does that impact our operations? I'm not sure. Uh, but I think the conversation certainly will change. Sure. And, and a lot of people are already getting rid of random testing, uh, kind of anticipation of this, uh, from, from my understanding. Uh, so, 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 Rick, I want to go to you. I mean, does the local change or the overall infrastructure of the union, do, 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 does their opinion change if it changes at the federal level and, and the employer level? Well, I don't believe it's going to change at the employer level. Um, on the federal level, I would just ask all my business partners here and friends here not to try to change um, on, on what those safety regulations that we've so, fought so hard to get, that we don't relax. Those are built in place to protect people mm -hmm. and that we don't try to change that. And, and I know the momentum. The pendulum has swung very hard left and people are very, very passionate about this uh, subject. And I don't want to say that we're not a advocate I think on the level of construction, we have to have some, some protection in place for the employees. But on the other hand, if you know that we have the CEOs and, and whatnot want to have a separate policy for the administrative staff, uh, uh, sometimes we think that they do need to smoke a little bit more weed. I, I think they'd be a little <laughs> bit more relaxed. Can I get that in the next <laughs> collective bargaining agreement? Can you put that in there? Bargain for that, right? And, and Roma, you you had you had indicated that yes, things would change it when it when it. Uh, it we're all making speculating here, but inevitably goes legal at the federal level. Uh, explain explain how that's what the changes are going to be from a business perspective, that it, or what you're going to recommend to business. Well, well what I would suggest is first, um, if you're going to have a zero base tolerance, make sure because of um, even right now because of a Persons or Americans with Disabilities Act, that you have a good faith reason for that zero, to, um, zero tolerance um, policy. Um, it, because you could be finding yourself in court um, in arguing against that. I would say get rid of, <laughs> we probably would eliminate um, pre-screening prior to employment. Um, I would also say that um, Make sure that your 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 staff, your your supervisors, your union members, everyone understands the definition of impairment, how to detect impairment, and that there's actually a policy in place that you are actually proving that the individual is impaired. And again, just to reinforce that if it is a safety sensitive position, no one is advocating that we get rid of those types of requirements. So Rick, have you had to step up education on this aspect? Um, I mean, and if so, what does that even look like? We, we have, uh, in uh, the pre-apprentice level, we, we've spent a lot of time and money. Uh, usually we're just a post-secondary education. We'd explain, explain what pre-apprentice is for people, that, that why that program exists, because I think that's an important step as to why you're educating. Yeah, uh, so before, we, we just wait till after they graduate from high school. Uh, to start their training, uh, but uh, we, we wanted to start earlier. We wanted to get people uh, exposed earlier. Uh, uh, everything, uh, the, the culture changed uh, within the last 30 years. It was, everything needs to be measured by how many kids go to college, and mm -hmm. college was, was the resounding theme, and if my kid goes to college and he graduates from college, that's, that's, that's a good thing, and sure. uh, the skilled trades took, you know, a yep. secondary step, so we, we had to do a lot more uh, money. We had to put a lot more money into uh, training um, and pre-apprentice. So we, we've we've seen that as uh, a, a better uh, pipeline into our trades, getting the exposure. They're not getting it, so we have to do it. Uh, nobody else is doing that uh, exposure piece. Uh, there's no more shop classes that uh, high schools have anymore. Uh, so we're, we're doing a better job in that. I've got the scar to prove that I went through <laughs> Good. Yeah, so we, we are, we, and, and we are having a lot more success there. It, it, it is, uh, it's going to be the way that we're going to move our industry towards more pre-apprentice. Sure, now, and now quickly how you're educating, how the change in education is, is happening with, uh, on the topic of marijuana. Well, so that's still very new. I mean, I, 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 we, we just set the standard very early that we, uh, marijuana is a drug. Uh, it is illegal on the federal level, and uh, there is a zero tolerance. And that uh, even before even getting in, you have to make sure that you... Uh, acknowledge that you know you won't and we do have pre-screening for that okay all right well uh we're wrapping up now so uh the next panel will, will start immediately after us so thank you very much and uh hopefully this was informative
And uh, thanks.